Hello and welcome back to part three of my realism tutorial. I'm showing you how to draw a dog uh, realistically using charcoal. My name is Adam O and I am the founder of Midwest Guild of Fine Art. And I will tell you a little bit more about the guild a little later in the video, but I want to dive right in to what we're doing today. So today we will be finishing the dog head minus, you know, touch-ups, which is uh, almost, which is always done at the end of a drawing. But we are going to be laying in lots and lots and lots of dark gray blobs. And then we'll be refining those uh, much in the same way or exactly the same way that we've done in the rest of the drawing. The difference in this section versus the uh, smaller sections like the ear or above the right eye is from this point on in the drawing, every single thing we do will be compared to what we've already drawn. So right now I'm, I'm blocking in the top part of the dog's head on the upper left hand side. And these are little blocks of fur that start out dark at the base and get lighter as they get toward the edge of the dog's head. And then in the finished product, we have little glowing strips of fur that happen along those edges. So what I'm doing is I'm blocking in very roughly the dark base layers of charcoal. And then we will refine those a little bit later using blending stumps and a 2.3 millimeter Tombow eraser. I believe they call those mono zero erasers. If you look those up, the mono, M-O-N-O, -O, is all in capital letters. And I think I got mine on Amazon for like three or four bucks, something like that. I know Hobby Lobby used to carry them. I'm not sure they, if they do anymore. But it's a really good investment for uh, work in realism, specifically when talking about portraits of people and pets because there's a lot of fine hairs that can be made using that eraser. And we'll go into more detail on that when we get a little closer to it. So right here I am scrubbing in very dark charcoal along the inside edge of the dog's ear. And the reason I'm doing that so dark is because I I don't need to layer this section. I mean I'm going to layer it it's just that there's no sense in laying in light layers and then gradually getting darker when I know that this is one of the darkest parts of the drawing. So I'm scrubbing that in just to make a defined outline between the dog's head and the dog's ear. And then as I go down this, part of what I'm scrubbing in is the ear itself. And the other part is there's another, I call it a mane, but it's not technically a mane. It's this big tuft of fur that puffs out below the dog's chin and along the top of her neck. And there are actually two sections that do this. There's one up front and then where her collar is that you can't see in the actual drawing or the photo, there's a second section that puffs out below that which is darker. So I know that going in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay the basic coat of charcoal here and then I'm going to go to the second uh, tuft of fur, which you can see me laying in here, and I want to do the outline of that. And from then on, I can start filling that in, but those little dark outlines that I've made will be kind of the, the rough borders that I've given myself to work inside. So in other words, I'm creating a landmark where normally there would not really be a landmark. I'm kind of forcing the landmark so I don't get lost and create the wrong shape. Now, as I'm doing this, I'm not just scrubbing it in and concentrating on the area that I'm working. I'm looking at where I'm scrubbing, and I'm also glancing back up to the eyes and to the other dark areas that we've laid in already, because we need to have a consistency here in the tone that we're laying in. So if I'm dropping this in and I notice that it looks too much like um, another area, let's say the upper right part of the dog's eye, where that big dark splotch is that goes along the forehead. It'll look too samey, <laughs> like if that's a word. 
it'll look too samey and then it'll be boring and flat and 2D. So I'm getting that in my head now as I'm drawing it so that I can fix it as I go and so that I'm mentally aware of what needs darkened later as we start refining this section. Now, while I'm laying this in, um, there's going to be a lot of time here where I'm just dropping in, you know, dark and light blobs. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the guild because it's something that I'm passionate about and there's a, there's a reason for it. So I picked up art again after not doing any artwork for over 20 years. Um, I just got back into it in April of 2019. And... Once I got the rust knocked off and I got back into doing realism, I wanted to join an art guild locally. And I searched and searched and I found uh, the same problems among all of them, which I'll go into in a minute. And then when I looked online, I found that those problems persisted through those guilds as well. So the number one problem was they all charged a membership fee which I'm not opposed to. If it's a good guild and it fits and um, it does what I need it to do for me personally, then I don't mind paying a membership fee. The problem is that on top of the membership fee, there, I would not be getting much in return. Uh, so the way they operated was you could tell they didn't understand what a guild is actually for. They would get together basically once per month which makes them inactive. And they would draw or paint flowers or old barns or, or whatever their, their quote-unquote theme was that month. That's not what a guild does. That's an art club. The original intention of a guild was a collection of artists, almost like a union, that held sway with local business owners, um, people of power, people with money, who could afford to buy art. And that guild was a community of artists that promoted each other and made sure that if someone needed an oil painting or a mural done or whatever, they went to the guild rather than going outside of town and hiring them from elsewhere. It kept the, the artwork local and it kept the artists paid. Now that's not the primary function of a guild anymore, though it's a, a very nice core function that needs to exist. It's also a community where artists can gather with each other. So un unless your family are sociopaths, then when you show them a piece of artwork that you've done, they're going to give you praise and tell you that it looks great. But if you're among another group of artists and you look for genuine feedback, those artists can tell you the way they would have done it. They can tell you what doesn't look right to their eye. They can help correct your techniques, and they can share the things that they've learned with each other. You wouldn't learn fine dining cooking from just an average home cook who's never really cooked in a restaurant before. They may have great advice, but they're not. You only take advice from people who are where you want to be, or at least you give that a, a lot more weight. So, in other words, without I'm trying not to ramble too much. But being in a group of artists is a good thing. And so I wanted a place where people could do that without having to pay membership fees and without having to adhere to a strict set of rules in an inactive group. So I created Midwest Guild of Fine Art. There's a real life version of it that I'm setting up now. And the online version I just started a few weeks ago and it's starting to grow already. There's a link to that if you'd like to join it in the description. I also have a Patreon, which I'm not going to beg for Patreon money, but if you wanted to support the guild, that's a pretty good way to do it because I can, you know, reinvest the money that I get through Patreon back into the guild and grow it, get professional cameras, get riggings for, you know, these videos so the videos aren't shaky and grainy. Um, I could get a printer. Uh, to where local artists at least could come in and get their stuff printed for free and get the digital file and then they can go out and put those on their shops or whatever. But anyway, now I don't want to get I don't want to turn this into an hour and a half long video on the guild, but I wanted you to be aware that it's a thing. No, it's not a scam. 
I don't sell your information. All you have to do is go to the join page, read the directions, follow the directions, and send me the email with all your stuff in it, and you're a member just like that. Now, back to the drawing. As you can see, after scrubbing in this basic uh, blobs along the dog's ear, along the sides of the head, she's already looking like a dog. And if you wanted, if you wanted to do like a high contrast, uh, almost minimalist sort of, uh, of drawing, you could leave that there without refinement and it would look fine. If that's you, what you like to do, do it. If all of our artwork looked the same, it would not be worth looking at. It would just be a bunch of artists drawing you know, the same crap and nobody wants to see that. You have to remember that art in the beginning was a, it had a practical purpose. It was a visual, physical representation of the world. If somebody wanted a picture of their wife, they had somebody paint a picture of their wife because cameras didn't exist. Art has taken on new meanings over the years because now we have the technology to photograph this dog. I have the photograph of the dog. So there's, for a practical purpose, there's no reason for me to be drawing this. I'm drawing it to hone my skills. If it was a commission, people want a drawing because they like the art and the uh, time, skill, and effort put behind it. And so that's one of the reasons I'm teaching you how to do a dog in this video rather than, let's say, a building or whatever. Because the number one most requested commission that I get is to draw someone's pet. Now along the bottom right hand portion of this uh, mane, I'm going to keep calling it a mane, I, I understand it's not a mane, but along the right hand corner of this not mane, I am scrubbing in shadows and I'm occasionally scrubbing hard with the q-tip in order to put in a darker line along that area to represent the shadow of a clump of hairs. Because I'm not going to be refining this with a Tombow eraser and I'm not going to be refining it with a, a blending stump or if I do it's not going to be very much. So the darker streak shadows that I do along this mane will be about as detailed as I get. It will look like a soft out of focus fur is because I'm taking a little bit of care when I'm dropping in these uh, lines and streaks because I won't be refining it later. It needs to be right the first time through. I'm adding in darker shadows so that the front part of the nose, especially uh, where her lips come down, um, that will have a, a very defined uh, shadow underneath it so that it creates a 3D effect. It creates depth. So when I mentioned a little bit earlier that I'm doing a lot of comparing when filling out the rest of the dog's face, that's actually one of the reasons that I'm jumping around from the mane to the bottom part of the jaw to the other part of the mane. To, I'm jumping all over because as I'm laying in these blocks of, um, not color, but blocks of gray, I notice there's another section of the, the drawing that needs to be darkened or defined.
So I will jump over to that area, lay in my little blocks of gray there, then compare it to what I've already done, and then adjust the other parts of the drawing and the part that I'm currently working on in order to make it balance. So right here on her cheek, it's not just fur that we have to worry about. There's a curvature to her face, an almost ripple effect that happens where the skull of the dog is not perfectly round. It has little divots in it, which causes the fur and her skin to have little waves. So we're making sure that those waves and those divots and those dents have are darker in the center than they are on the outside and they need to be defined otherwise the drawing will look flat and two-dimensional. And then as you can see here I'm bouncing back up to the eyes because in comparison to the rest of the drawing the eyes looked grainy to me. So I want to smooth that out maybe remove a little bit of the uh, extra soft charcoal from the black parts of her eyes and that will happen as I'm lightly scrubbing with the q-tip and I'm just adjusting, adjusting, adjusting. So now I am cleaning off one of my q-tips and I didn't like uh, the way that particular one felt. It was too, it had a bunch of stray hairs on it that had started to ball up which meant that it had, it was too, um, how do I explain this? If I would have used it as is, it would have created dark lines rather than smooth lines. And so I got one that was a little fluffier, loaded it up lightly with charcoal, and now I'm going back into the upper portion of the head to lay in the softest coat of gray that I can manage. I'm barely touching the paper here. And then as that Q-tip loses charcoal, because we're, remember, we're scrubbing on paper, so the paper is going to pick up charcoal from the Q-tip. Then I scrub a little bit harder. And if I get into an area like above the eye where it needs to be light, but not as light as the top of the head, as I scrub, I'm going to overlap my strokes into the dark areas that I've already got drawn so that I pull the charcoal into the new area and it makes it uh, blend a little bit nicer. And then once I get that done, I'm going to go into the top part of the head, uh, lay in a tiny bit more gray, and then I'm bouncing back to the forehead because now all of this white fur in the middle of the drawing needs to be darkened up into a very light or a mid-tone gray all the way down. I could, and you could if you were doing this drawing, leave that as negative space and create a super high contrast uh, where the white fur is. I don't want to do that with this one because one of the most interesting parts of the drawing that will start to pop out as we add in the background are the glints of light that happen over her left ear, her uh, the middle of her, her head on top, over the right part of her skull, and then I think there's even a couple places along the edge of her mane that glow white because she's backlit by sunlight. They are much brighter white than the rest of the, uh, the fur. And so in order to make those pop out and in order to see them correctly, we have to have a contrasting base to compare them to. So what we're doing is as the white fur on this dog gets a little bit darker, you will compare that to the parts that are even whiter than that and those white parts that are negative space will glow. And it happens by comparison because your brain is telling you that the dog's fur is white and then it looks up into those brightly lit areas and by comparison your brain thinks holy crap that's like that's really white. Now as I lay in that, uh, that light gray on the white fur, by comparison, it will start to make the dark splotches on the dog's fur look lighter because that's no longer resting against negative space. It's resting against a light gray. So in order to fix that, I need to darken up the darker areas. And that way they stand out against each other. I'm increasing the tone on the lighter areas and therefore I have to increase the tone on the darker areas in order to be consistent. 
otherwise it'll look washed out. Now I mentioned in my last video that as I'm doing this, the process happens so slowly that you don't really notice a large difference between what I'm doing now versus what I'll, I'll be doing in 30 seconds or whatever. If you really want to see how dramatic the changes are, pick any point in the video, watch it for a few seconds, and then skip up 15 minutes. And you'll see a fairly dramatic difference between what I'm doing at that moment versus what happens 15 minutes later. Please don't watch the whole video like that because it will be confusing and weird. <laughs> but if you want to see the differences, that's a pretty good way to do it. Now I'm in a very, very tricky part here because there are a couple things going on. One, the fur is white. Two, it's also embedded in shadow. And three, the mane that happens to the left of that muzzle is almost the same shade of gray as the shadowed nose. So if we're not careful here, the nose will kind of disappear into the mane and it'll look flat. So I have to be very, very careful about how light I make the nose and how dark I make the mane because I want that to still appear 3D. Remember, I am adjusting the contrast in my drawing compared to the original photo because the original photo has much darker shadows along that left-hand side, and I personally don't want that many shadows in this particular drawing. Most of the time I do, because the darker those shadows, the more realistic the drawing looks, at least to me. In this one, the shadows covered up too much detail for me, and so I wanted to soften those up in order to bring details of the dog's fur and nose out. But when doing that, it creates a danger that I may go too uh, soft on one of those two shadows. And if it washes together too badly, then I could, the drawing just won't look right. Now you can see those little waves along her fur that I've been slowly refining. It starts to look a lot more realistic. So I'm, I'm starting to get happy with that. So I will bounce back down to the bottom of the nose and along the, her top lips. And I need to start uh, throwing in shadows. And then you'll see me grab my kneaded eraser. And I'm going to lighten up some of these other areas so that the spots on the top of her nose become more defined. Now I compare that to the rest of the drawing and notice that there are a few areas that need to be darkened in those little wavy shadows along the right hand side of her face. So I make those quickly, I move on to the main, and you can see me start to define the areas of her lower jaw. Once I get those defined, and it doesn't take much, it's just a tiny little scrub, I'm going to go back in and start laying in the, um, the Q-tip created hairs of her bottom right mane. Now this is a lot less shadow in this section. So what I'm doing is I'm scrubbing in fat lines to where it looks like uh, kind of the blurred shadows, the sort of out of focus shadows um, that are not defined. And then once I have those laid in, I'm just going to go back in with a fairly clean Q-tip and with small circles blend those together so that the lines become even less defined. It'll end up looking like soft fur rather than uh, drawn hairs. It needs to be fluffy and out of focus.
So now you're going to notice that I've got a little less bouncing around because I want, since this main is going to be done 100% in Q-tips, I, I don't think I go back over it with anything else. I want to get this right, right off the bat, and I want to get it filled in so that it's done. One of the things that can keep you motivated when doing a detailed drawing like this is get a section finished once you're at the point where you can finish it and it'll feel more like progress. It's just a little psychological trick that I use for myself because if you're doing a lot of bouncing around and you're doing a lot of refinement, you could easily just keep doing that forever and not finding a stopping point and it will feel tedious and it'll feel like a job. And I don't really want you know to to get to the point to where I'm thinking, oh Christ, I've got to actually work on this drawing today. So once I have that section filled out and ready for either you know the final product or it's done enough to where I can tell that you know that section is uh, is at least got a really good baseline on it, it feels like completion, and so I get a little bit more motivated to hit the finish line and I can jump to something else at that point. I don't know if that makes sense to anyone else, but it works for me. Um, so now I can look comparatively, and I can see that the left-hand mane and the left-hand cheek were way too light compared to what I just added in. And since I needed that contrast to be there, that needed to be much darker. And notice as I lay those in, the muzzle and the nose of the dog starts to pop forward and it looks like it has much more depth as I add darkness to that area. And now it's starting to look way more 3D than what it did before. So we're in a cycle right now of, you know, do part of the drawing, compare, fix, adjust, move on, and then just repeat that process. So then I can go down into the second part of the main that I told you about a little earlier in the video. And I'm going to really load up the Q-tip really thick with charcoal this time because this area is way darker than the rest of the fur, uh, at least in this area. And so there's not a need for me to do a layer, then refine, then a layer, then refine and build up to that darkness. I might as well start out really dark right off the bat, especially since as we go out from the dog's face, we're going to put in less and less detail so that it gives that sort of uh, blurry, out of focus look. So I'm really going to town and dropping in very dark, scrubby charcoal. Then after I get those roughly thrown in, I can use the circle blending trick, just blending in small circles to blend those lines together and make them look smooth. Now there's a section of this fur as well, I think it's through here, that the, the outer or frontmost layer of her mane, the one that's uh, the, at the top of her neck, also has some fur that glows from the backlit areas. So I'm kind of in preparation for that, leaving a thin layer of, or a line of hair along that edge that's not filled in. Um, I think I may fill it in a little bit later with a base coat of gray and then go over it with the eraser. But for right now, I'm kind of defining borders for myself to stay in so that I know that these are two separate sections of uh, the dog's fur rather than one big blob that has a darker shadow on the bottom. All of this is so that I can mentally keep track of where I'm at. 
So for this next part, I'm going to reload my scrap paper with more extra soft charcoal, and I'm going to really load up the uh, tip of my blending stump. Then you can see I kind of spin it on the, uh, the scrap paper. That's to get rid of any additional charcoal dust. And now I can go back and start adding in even more refinement to the dark area above her right eye. Because remember, I've gone over this several times with a Q-tip, which makes the original hairs that we've dropped in kind of fade and get uh, a little fatter and more of like a gradient than a sharp line. We do want that. We want those to fade out a little bit. But we also want small hairs here and there, very uh, sporadically, to have a sharper look to them. Because that will create the illusion of focus in the drawing. And as I'm dropping these in, I'm also being aware that there are those glowy sections of her fur. Uh, so I'm going to overlap some of the strokes that I'm making in the darker parts of the fur into the area that's going to be uh, glowing and much brighter than the rest of it because it'll create the illusion that some of those hairs uh, dive into those areas and have their own individual shadows. Otherwise, if we don't have those overlaps, it'll look just like a big circular blob of white and it won't look natural. So I'm doing that very delicately along this little section that's uh, going to glow you know, on its own. Um, but you can tell I'm being very, very light with the, uh, with the strokes here. I want these to be roughly the same tone and the same shade as the area that's below it. Um, the only difference is this is going to be individual shadows and individual clumps of hair. And so they're going to stand out and create a contrast with the glowy white section that's below it. If I get this too dark, then I have to go tone it down with an eraser, and I'm trying not to put myself in a position where I have to do that. Now keep in mind that as I get into the darker areas of the fur here, the lines that I'm creating with the smudge stick will be darker than they are in the light areas. And even though it looks like I'm making tons and tons and tons of, uh, of strokes here, it's not as many as you think. Sometimes, you know how a golfer will take a couple practice swings without hitting the ball? It's kind of like that when I'm using a smudge stick. Sometimes I'll make a couple strokes in the air, um, just absentmindedly. I'm not conscious that I do it. Um, to make sure that I'm on the right path, and then say the third or the fourth stroke that I make actually touches paper. I don't do that often, but if I'm working in an area that's especially sensitive, I will do that to make sure that I don't end up putting a mark that's way off balance and in a different direction than the rest of the, the hairs and the fur. And as I add them, I think one of the more interesting parts of this section is that as I add them, notice the area right on top of her eye. Um, she has sort of this weird eyebrow arch that goes over it, but the white that's around it will look like it protrudes away from the rest of her skull, which is the way it does in real life. And it makes it come out toward the camera because it gives the illusion that there's more light there than there is on the rest of the fur. And you can create that just by refining the way I'm doing here and slowly darkening up and then comparing that to that light spot above her eye and adjusting until you get it right. 
don't get in a rush with this part. It's easy to try to get into a rush with all of it because it can be tedious. It's not a fun thing to do. Uh, but when you're taking your time and you're getting it right, the end result will look way more realistic than if you just slap that sucker in there and said, that's okay, I'm done. That's dark and that's all I need it to be is dark. Those little subtle deep shadows along those certain areas and those lighter areas that create the illusion of curve, those are what separates a realistic drawing from an amateurish 2D looking drawing. And it takes time and it takes patience. Now I'm going along that bottom part and adding in some hairs, but I'm not using the tip of the smudge stick. I'm actually using almost the flat side of the smudge stick because that tapers down like a pencil uh, because I want those lines that go toward the edge of her face, especially into the mane, to be fatter. Then when I go back up into that eye section and forehead section, I can use the tip in order to get thinner hairs. That takes a little bit of practice, and I, I would say that would be a good one to just pull up a scrap piece of paper and start practicing dropping in hair shadows with the smudge stick and using different parts of the smudge stick, the point, the side, the taper, to see how those lines differ from each other because you will use many different types of strokes in many different areas of the smudge stick in order to pull off different levels of focus. So right now on the bottom part of her eye, I'm using the very point of the smudge stick because I want those hair shadows to look more like individual hairs and they will look way more focused. When I go into this section to the bottom right, I'm kind of angling that uh, smudge stick down um, so it's a little bit more parallel to the paper so that I can use the, flat, the flatter part of the smudge stick to make fatter lines. Not just fatter lines, but less defined lines that get kind of fuzzy on the sides. Now we're really going to start to define that little V-shaped area in the top of her head with a, a lot of heavy charcoal on the smudge stick because we want these lines to kind of stand out. And the reason is that that's not really a focus thing. It's more um, of a, a way to make the hairs look like they're reflecting hard backlit light because those individual clumps of hair will reflect a lot of light but as you go down and around them toward the bottom parts of those hairs, those will have much harder shadows on them. So we want to kind of define those areas uh, right out of the gates. And you'll notice that as I go around the top of her head and to the right, that area starts to get a lot more definition than what it had before. It's not just shadows. It's not just blocks. Now we're starting to see the illusion of fur pop into the picture. Now I'm going to continue to do that along uh, the ear. And this particular section is not really a part of the ear. I think it's more like she has a tuft of fur around that area where the fur comes out along where the her temples are. And then it dives back into itself and there's this dark section that starts to become less defined. It's like a big tuft of fur. So I want to be able to highlight some of those shadows in that area, but not so many that it starts to look like the rest of her face. So we're adding a little bit of texture, but we're not going overboard in that area. 
Now when we get into the ears, the ears have very, very short hairs along the edge of them. And so we're going to pull from the area we just worked in into the ear uh, to create the illusion that there are tiny little hairs that are popping out along the edge. And so I'm being kind of careful here and I'm scrubbing it in um, in order to create a border between the two areas and to define the ear much greater than what we had it. Because not only are there fine hairs that are along the edge of that, but there's also a thin shadow that goes around the whole thing. It's, it's super thin. We don't want that to look like we just outlined it the way you'd outline, say, like a comic book drawing. We want to make sure that those areas are scrubbed in um, in kind of a vertical manner uh, to, the, to the ear. I don't even know if vertical is the right word. Um, what's the opposite of parallel? I, I totally forget. Perpendicular, I think. Anyway, uh, we're wanting to work from the, the inside of the ear out and make sure that that's kind of a jagged edge. Then we can go back up into the ear itself on the dark uh, parts and we're laying in those fatter shadows that I use, um, that I told you about with the side of the smudge stick because again, this is less defined and it's a darker area on top of that. So we want these strokes to be fatter, blurrier, fuzzier, uh, but without them, that part of the ear doesn't have as much texture and so it becomes less interesting. I don't want it to be a focal point, but I don't want it to be so flat that it looks like we just decided to not finish the ear. And now, just like before, uh, we're looking at the area we just did, comparing it to the areas that we already have done, and then adjusting that accordingly. So as you see me taking these large, long swoops along the top uh, right-hand part of her forehead, that is to um, kind of blend these shadows that we just laid in a little bit better. Then I can drop down into the corner of her eye and define that a little bit better. And I'm doing all those because I've compared it to the, the ear that we just worked on and have told myself, okay, these, these hairs need to be more defined. These need to be smoothed out. Uh, there needs to be a rougher edge along uh, the temple area of the dog. So we're gonna scrub those in and it's look, compare, adjust. We're doing a lot of refinement here. In fact, almost everything we're doing in this video is refinement. Now we go back down to this little tuft of hair on the bottom uh, corner of her jaw and I'm pushing that further into her face to create the illusion that the hairs there are not just soft, um, but they're longer there than they are on the rest of her face. Then I'm going to grab the Tombow eraser, which is by far my favorite part of, of doing hair on a portrait of a human or a pet, and I'm going to not erase by scrubbing, uh, even though it looks like that's what I'm doing. I'm taking single strokes um, into the dark parts of the fur. So if I'm going on the bottom part, I'm making a stroke that will start at the bottom and go in. And then if I need to define those, that's why it looks like I'm starting in the middle and going out. That part's kind of hard to explain, it, but it's another thing that you could practice with on scrap paper is laying in a big fat blob of charcoal and then very quickly and lightly uh, slicing in those hairs into that darkness. So then I go back up into the upper right forehead area and I'm gonna add uh, 
what I believe will end up being pretty much the final highlights for this part. And it's a combination of white hairs that overlap into that section and a few hit and miss light glints that bounce off of individual hairs. This is the part that will make people think that you sat down and drew each individual tiny hair one at a time, whereas other artists will look at it and usually though the people with experience will, will go, oh, I see what you did there. You dropped in a block, then you dropped in shadows, then you dropped in highlight, and you just kept doing that in layers. Other artists will appreciate the method in which you do it. The average viewer will look at what you've done and think, oh my God, how did you have the patience to sit there and draw every one of those hairs? But little do they know, you use little Bob Ross type tricks to make them appear. This is all about overlapping on the edges of these dark areas because if we don't, it will look like we have two defined areas, one dark and one light. If we slightly overlap those, it becomes more natural and the light parts will fade into the dark parts. It will have more of a natural gradient, which is the way um, people normally look. Now this part on the ear, you've got to be careful with. We want to put some highlights there, but they need to be so light and so subtle that they almost don't exist. I'm barely touching the paper whenever I work um, in the, this actual ear and the parts that are under the ear because a lot of those are bathed in shadow as well. So we don't want to have bright, bright um, eraser marks in this area. They, they just need to be subtle, smooth, and barely there. Now, as we get to the top of the head, that's a different story because that's where the backlit sunlight is coming through and those are going to be very bright. And so I'm increasing the pressure um, and I'm making kind of a fatter, broader, harder stroke there. And once we get that background in, you'll really see where that starts to pop out and become a thing. And now to finish this off, uh, I'm going back into the eyes, um, both the black part and the mid-tone gray, you know, that splotch. And I'm overlapping between the two, and I'm being very, very stingy with the amount of these that I'm putting in. Some of them I'm putting in with hard pressure. Some of them I'm barely touching. Um, and in fact, some of them won't even show up on video or the paper but we're creating uh, highlights that are kind of almost random in spots, or I guess those aren't highlights, those are single white hairs. And then the highlights need to be a little bit brighter than that. So I'm being careful and I'm being stingy in that area. Now we're really gonna go to town on filling this in. This is where you're gonna see one of the more dramatic changes um, in the, the dog's fur. We're going to start throwing in some very dark areas that will be a very um, high contrast to the white glowy parts. And we're going to start blocking in more of those mid-tone grays so that the top left-hand part of the face doesn't look splotchy. So we're going to throw those in and then refine the same way that we've been doing in the rest of the drawing, but we're going to be doing it in a, in a much larger area. Also, it looks like I'm resting my hand on the paper here. I'm not. I'm actually hovering my hand maybe a quarter of an inch to a half inch above the paper um, so that I don't smudge it. If you're not comfortable doing that, I would put your paper, your scrap paper, on the drawing itself so you can rest your hand. But I believe that when, I think you should practice hovering your hand when you're doing large area blending like this. Uh, because you, you have more mobility in your hand and you want that hand to be able to swing out into large areas without smudging or you know running across the paper. So I hover it, I use larger strokes, um, and I let my hand move a little bit more freely than I do in the rest of the drawing. 
And now we're really getting into some comparison stuff here. I noticed that cheek needed to be darkened up at least double what it was. And I think we'll even go back another two or three times and darken it up even more than that. Um, but now's when we really start doing a lot of comparison. Notice how I, I went up into the corner of that left eye and put a much darker shadow there. Um, that will end up going over several times too. But I'm the point of, of saying all this is that we've noticed that we're not nearly close to being dark enough on that side. So we're starting some major, major refinement in this area. Now I'll put my scrap paper down because as I'm laying in these uh, shadows and hairs the way I did you know, in the other section, I want more control over the direction that my, my strokes are going. So in order to do that, I anchor the ball of my hand right above my wrist to that scrap paper. I hold the entire thing down with my left hand and then I just use my fingers to make the strokes. Now, if you're not comfortable with that and you have a more comfortable way to make straight strokes that go in a single direction, use that method. Now, if you get into a section like I just did where I had an oops moment, I found a part of that um, smudge stick that was way, it had way too much charcoal on it. Um, just take a kneaded eraser to clean that up because uh, other erasers can be harsher to the paper. You're just wanting to lift that out and thin it a little bit, but you don't want to destroy the paper. So I just knead mine into a point. And then with barely touching the paper, I kind of twist the kneaded eraser and lift that area off in order to thin it down. But we, we want to be careful to not destroy the paper. Otherwise, as we go over this area again with Q-tip, if we have to go over it again, that area that you've destroyed with a, a harsher eraser will pick up more charcoal than what you expect. And there will be a giant splotch there that you can't do anything about. Now, one of the things that I'm doing here is there are a couple strips of light that glint off of this area, but they're not harsh light. So one of the things I'm doing is I'm kind of softening this area up with a smudge stick. I'm laying in the hairs, but I'm overlapping them between those two dark areas that run almost parallel to each other so that the hairs go from one section to the other. And it takes out some of the definition so that it doesn't look quite as um, uh, comic booky, I guess is the word. And what I mean by that is that, you know, those old school comic books, the areas would be much more defined. They would be their own shapes. But here we need everything to flow into each other. <laughs> 
Now, as I get into this forehead, I'm going to be very, very sparing with these hairs that I'm dropping in, and I'm, I'm almost doing it almost haphazard. I'm using the middle of the taper of that smudge stick to very, very lightly drop in some uh, shadows there. They'll not even show up on video. And even in the real life drawing, which looks much more detailed than what you'll see in the video, those need to be almost non-existent. We're adding just a little bit of texture, but if we go too hard on those, that's not going to look white. It'll look like we tried to draw single hair. So they need to be kind of fluffy and very light gray, just barely darker than the area that's behind it. But when I go back up to the areas on the top left where I'm working at now on the ears and stuff, those need to be a little bit more defined, a little bit darker in order to make the glowy parts of that backlit lighting pop out and glow more than what it does now. Now remember how we did that first ear that's on the right. We're doing the same thing with this one. We're kind of scrubbing in shadows. We're keeping them fat, kind of fluffy, and we're wanting less detail in the ear than what there is in the rest of the, the face. As we lessen the amount of detail that we put in, it will look like the camera loses focus and it will create a, a depth that you that is kind of unbelievable when you get it done. It's it looks so cool, but you need to have different layers of focus. So in other words, we can't just put in a big block of color, make it out of focus at the same rate as we will eventually make the background, because then it will just look like um, we've got two defined areas, one in focus and one not in focus. What we'd rather have is varying depths of detail. So we'll get to the ear and it will be a little less focused than the face. Then we get back into uh, the bulk of the body and that will be even less detailed and fuzzy. Then when we get to the very part, uh, the deepest parts of the background that appear on the top of the drawing, those will be so little detailed that they won't, you, you'll hardly be able to tell what those things are in the background. They're just very blobby, blurry uh, splotches of dark charcoal. But if we create those different layers of focus, it looks much more natural than if we just have two, maybe three layers of focus. So just like the gradients that we're using, we're wanting to be gradual in how we lay those out. So now that as I go back into this uh, left eye. I'm comparing it to the shadows that I just put on the ear and I want that eye to pop out more, to look more detailed. So I'm being very careful in laying in thin shadows with the very tip of my, uh, my smudge stick. And then as I fade in the black part of the eye, the really black outline, as I fade that into the dark splotch, which is more like a mid-tone under that, I want that to fade a little fatter. And that just makes the fur look more natural and makes the shadows of the hairs that I'm laying in pop out more. It's all by comparing one area to another that I, that I make those decisions. And um, it's the, the reasoning I use for the detail versus non-detail that I'm laying in. So here's an example of that. We're wanting to start to define these dark splotches and the, the dark spots in the middle of her nose and the muzzle area. In reality, those splotches look like defined circles or ovals, but that's kind of an illusion. Those are created by splotches on the, both the skin and the hairs themselves. So we define that area by adding in just a few dark hairs here and there, then we're gonna do the same thing along the very left edge of the, uh, the muzzle. 
So there has to be a contrast between the shadows that the hairs make versus the shadow that the overall shape of her face makes. There needs to be a contrast and a definition between those two things. Otherwise, what it'll look like is that we just took a Q-tip and smudged a bunch of spots in there and called it a day and said that's enough. It's not enough to make it look realistic. Now keep in mind too that the very top of her nose, like the bridge of her nose, those hairs are extremely short. And so when we're doing the strokes here, we need to make sure that comparatively to like her forehead where there's a lot longer fur, we need to make sure that these uh, by comparison look short. So our shadows are gonna be uh, maybe only a quarter of an inch long Whereas above the eye, they can be much longer. They can be two or three inches, uh, depending on how long you want to make the fur look. And then keep in mind that the fur that's right above her nose, the, the black part of her nose, that, that is really, really short and it's sparse. And so we want to make sure that we get the length of the strokes correct and the amount of strokes that we add in. Now I'm almost just scrubbing these in uh, because of the same thing I just explained. You know, the hairs are shorter, they're, they're sparser. But it's also, remember, this is a combination of black skin peeking through white fur. And the hair kind of splits and goes two different directions as we get across the bridge of the nose, especially on the upper part, the black part of the nose as it goes into the muzzle those hairs start to go different directions. So we need to, to pay close attention to the flow of that fur. And we need to make sure that we're not putting in shadows that are so harsh that it looks like that we just tried to draw them in one at a time with a pencil. And now I've noticed as I'm putting these in that the shadows along the muzzle as it dips in to the left hand side has a specific tone and shade of gray. And then as you compare it to her cheek, there's a, a fairly defined line there that um, you normally wouldn't think was there. So very quickly, I picked up the Q-tip and I added in that line and darkened up those shadows just a bit. And that's just to mentally remind myself that I need to go back to that later and refine it even further. It's adding a mental landmark yet again so that I don't forget to do that. 
Now along the edges of those splotches, those little spots on her nose, those will also fade into white fur. And they'll have tiny little hairs on the outside of them that are almost unnoticeable, that will be slightly, slightly lighter than the spot itself. So what I'm doing is I'm carefully dragging out from the corners of those spots and overlapping it into the white, but I'm using a very, very light touch so that these spots become a little less defined. And I mean barely less defined. Think of them more like stray hairs than, you know, shadows and shapes. Now we're going to go back in and start doing one of my favorite parts, which is adding in the highlight hairs with that Tombow eraser. And these strokes are very light. When you do the strokes on a lighter area that's a very, very light gray, they'll show up, but they won't show up as much. When you do them over a dark area like this section in the upper left, if you barely touch that eraser to that, it's going to lift off that that gray. And so you have to be careful. You have to use a light touch and quick strokes. Then if you need to lighten it up even more, you can go back in and do it. But if you push too hard, that stroke is going to be too fat from you putting pressure on the eraser itself. And it can end up being too white because you took off too much charcoal. So I'm intentionally making the strokes light and I'm making them quick so that they can be thin and they can have a, a more uniform curve to each of those hairs that pop out there. The slower you go on this, the more wiggly the line will look. The quicker and sharper your strokes, the more it'll look like hair because it takes the shake out of your hand whenever you do it that way. It's almost like flipping the eraser across the, uh, the drawing. You'll also notice I'm using the uh, hovering hand technique here because if I'm making longer strokes or if I'm wanting to make a straighter, kind of curvier, non-wiggly stroke, I find it easier if my hand is hovering. If I anchor my hand, I'm kind of restricting the curve, I'm tightening the curve and I'm allowing for more shakiness of my hand. That's just for me personally. If you find that you can do steadier, smoother, uh, gradually curving uh, strokes with your hand anchored, by all means do that. I just find it way more comfortable myself to do it with my hand hovering than I could get them done if I were anchoring my hand to the drawing. This bottom part of the nose, or the upper part of the nose, bottom part of the muzzle is also one of my favorite parts because I'm going to do small little sticky short hairs there and I'm doing them in specific directions because they part like the Red Sea. One, one section goes right, one section goes left. And as I add those little erased white hairs in there, it slowly starts to look more like it's a mixture of, of white fur and brown fur. And you can start to see the black parts of the skin pop out from underneath each of those. It's one of my favorite parts of doing a drawing of a dog. <laughs> 
So once I, I get those done, I'm going to go back around the edge of the nose and I'm going to start defining those white hairs and those reflections. And now we're going to start to see the nose and the muzzle start to look like it's covered in fur rather than covered in Q-tip smooth splotches. Then I will pull those little single furs along the edge of her lip and the edge of the mane into the darker areas uh, to make it look like those hairs overlap and are in the foreground. Now, as I'm starting to compare these strokes, just like before with every other part of the drawing, I'm going to pick out some things that need refined and in this instance, it's the top part of the jaw where her lip overlaps the bottom part of her jaw. I need to darken up a specific section of it, but I also need to drag out that line a little bit more so that it doesn't just look like a single streak. It looks like a lip that overlaps you know, the rest of her fur. Then comparing that stroke to the mane, I noticed that some of these shadows needed to be darkened up and we needed to kind of refine that area and I also wanted to finish out the bottom right hand part of this drawing to give myself another motivational boost. So I should be getting into that shortly because once I get that laid in, then mentally I'm telling myself oh, the bottom right section of the drawing is done. I don't have to mess with that anymore. That's a completion. That's a small finish line um, that I've crossed. And so now it feels like, you know, I'm, I'm making progress. Now keep in mind that this is that secondary tuft of fur that happens at the bottom of her neck. And so that's going to be a little further into the picture, a little deeper into the picture. So I want even less detail there than what I have in this front mane. So I add in that blob of charcoal for the secondary part of the you know, fur tufts. Then I can compare it to the one above it and make adjustments. So I'm going back, back in and adding in a little bit more gray here and making sure that the, there's no high definition marks there. Then as I'm doing that, I'm looking at her eye and her cheek and comparing that to that. And so I'm kind of working from right to left, making comparisons and adjustments and adding layers of refinement on refinement. And we're actually getting very close to this, the, to the, the head being done. Aside from touch-ups, this is pretty much done and then we're gonna start working on the background very soon. Um, so this feels like another milestone, another piece of progress uh, that will help us keep motivated to keep going and finish this out. Because when we get into the background, the background has so little detail, it's like that final you know, 10, 20 yards of a, of a run where you're like, oh my God, it's right there. Put everything you've got into it and let's get this done. So now the refinement that I'm doing on this left hand side, um, I really love how this looks when I start darkening up just small little strokes like that. It starts to look more like tufts of fur and less like a big block of gray.
Now this area on the left, one of the reasons I'm doing this is there's a like two sections of fur there that capture more light than the rest because they don't just jut out to the left, they also jut forward a bit. And so what I've done is I've taken the flat part of the kneaded eraser, pushed and twisted to lift some of that off, and suddenly that section looks like it's capturing and reflecting more light than the rest of it. And if we need to adjust that, you know, more as far as darkness goes, that's that's fine. But right now, that little extra bit of light that we've thrown in there makes it look like it's clumpier. It doesn't look all uniform. Now a little bit more refinement, we're going to load that q-tip up with uh, some more charcoal and she's got those little dots on her nose where the hairs come out. Not all of these hairs are defined uh, in the photo and I don't want them to be as defined in the drawing, but I do want the little spots where they connect to her face to be there. Uh, because it, I mean all dogs have those little divots on the sides of their nose where the little whiskers come out. So when we put those in, even if we only draw in three or four of those hairs very lightly, um, it's going to create the illusion that she's got multiple whiskers coming out because the dots are there. It's a way to trick the viewer's brain into thinking there's more detail than there actually is. And now that those are in, I'm going to refine the shadows around that part of her nose a little bit better uh, to make it look like, like the end of her nose is kind of bulbous. And the way her teeth are on the inside of her mouth pushes out that skin in certain areas. Um, so that's what kind of gives it that ripple effect where you're, you'll have a shadow here but not here and another one over here but not here. We're going to define those areas and start pulling out some of the shadows from her eyes and her upper jaw into each other so that it starts to become a more cohesive um, shape, a more cohesive drawing, and a more cohesive um, uh, tone, I guess you'd call it. Now I can go back to the edge of the nose and start blending some of those shadows together so it doesn't look like it just ends right there. Um, it needs to kind of fade down into the fur on her neck. So kind of touch that up a little bit. And now I'm going to go back with my blending stump and kind of define the area along that top lip that's where that dark streak is there. There are some hairs that go up into that lip and a few hairs that go down from it. So I'm going to just kind of lay those in quickly. And then I can go back through the areas that are between the out of focus section and the in focus section and add in just a few highlights there with the side of the blending stump and kind of define those out so that it doesn't just look like it's in focus in this area and out of focus in this area it fades back into um, less focus and less focus as you go deeper into the drawing and towards the edges of the drawing. I'm barely touching the paper here too. Now it looks like I'm scrubbing all the way across this area, but I'm actually not. Um, I'm pulling some of those hairs from the side of her face into the tuft of the fur along her mane. Uh, 
and then I'm stabbing inward from the edge of that mane toward the inside of her jaw uh, and pointing them right at the outline of her her nose and her muzzle. Uh, and that just gives the illusion that stray hairs, or that, not stray hairs, but the hairs themselves have shadows in between them. Again, not doing it with harsh detail. Uh, I'm doing it with the thicker, flatter side of the smudge stick in order to create the illusion of the shadows of clumps of hair. Now we're going to do the same thing with the left-hand side of the, uh, the mane in order to show that there's a little bit of shadow peeking through the ends of those hairs. And we can just push those right out from the area that we already have shaded outward into the next section. And at the same time, we're pulling a, a set of dark shadows and dark lines into the top layer of that mane itself. So we're doing two things at the same time. We're basically defining the edges of the mane, but not really defining a lot of the inside of the mane. One of the reasons that we do that is because as the hair clumps together, it'll look like more of a solid mass. And as you get toward the ends of the hairs, those will look more frayed and uh, because there will be certain ones that are slightly longer than the others, there'll be certain hairs that catch more highlights than the others. And so that's why it looks more pointy at the ends of those hairs than it does at the base of them. And that's why we're adding more detail on the outside edges than we are on the inside base. Now let's clean that Q-tip up a bit more uh, because we need to add in some uh, very light grays to the ends of her muzzle and along the edge of it where it curves down into uh, the, the upper lip. So we want to clean that off a lot, then barely scrub that in just to darken up uh, just a very light gray so that it looks like it has a curve rather than a hard to find shadow. Then we can grab the Tombow eraser and remember there's a section of hair here that on the outside glows a little bit more than the rest. So we're gonna to start to add those in a little bit on the edges of the fur. We're just pulling in little sharp lines very lightly to kind of break that up and make it look like the hairs are separated at the ends. I'm doing the same thing along the right hand side but I'm putting more pressure onto it because there's not a lot of darkness there. Um, but whenever I jump up into the temple area like you see here, those I'm using a much lighter stroke on because those will pop out more as you erase into it. So in other words, if you're erasing into a very light area, it's not going to be as defined because there's not a lot of difference between your eraser stroke versus the very light gray. But when you get up into darker areas, it'll become much more defined because you're instantly comparing it to the background. So I try to do those with a lighter stroke. Now when we go up into the dog's lip and lower jaw, we'll do the same thing. Light strokes here because the hairs are smaller, thinner, shorter. And so we're just wanting to break up that area to make it look like the hairs along that are jutting out and kind of overlapping the rest of her face. And with that, the dog's head is pretty much done. Uh, on the next video, we'll be wrapping it up. Uh, we'll be throwing in the background, doing just a little bit more refinement with the shadows. But we've got one more video to go and this will be a finished piece. 
So thank you for joining me. If you're interested in that guild, please uh, click the link, uh, just read the instructions and follow those and I will get you a profile page set up. If you're interested in uh, doing you know, a, a Patreon donation, I would definitely appreciate that, but it's not required by any means. And uh, with that, I will see you on the next video.